Thank you. Good to be here. Amen. Good to have everybody with us today. Father, I pray, Lord, that you give me the gift of teaching. Open our hearts today to receive the truth and the Word of God. In thy name I pray. Amen. All right. Turn to the book of John, Gospel of John. Gospel of John. And verse number, chapter 21, verse 15. John 21, 15. John 21, 15. Get this thing straightened up. John 21, 15. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. He saith unto him, now note carefully, feed my sheep. Saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Saith to him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest what thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Saith to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said to him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Verily I say to thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he'd spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. Now what you have here is a commission. The Lord is commissioning Peter. He said, I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and I give unto thee the keys of the kingdom, which means that he would individually open up doors, and he did. In the book of Acts chapter number 10, he opened up the door of the Gentiles. You notice that Cornelius, a Gentile centurion, is saved, and God uses Peter to do that. Now, we know the first part of the book of Acts is, is focused upon Peter and upon his ministry. And then when the Apostle Paul is saved, we notice a, a shift takes place. And uh, we find that a confrontation takes place. So when Paul is saved, there becomes a confrontation between Peter and Paul. It's not that they were teaching different doctrine, but they were, is they were dealing with different issues. Peter was dealing with the circumcision, Paul with the uncircumcision. And there's a transition that takes place between the circumcision and the uncircumcision. That transition is where the Jews, the Judaizers, tried to keep believe the, the faithful uh, under the law or certain elements of the law. And the Apostle Paul said, absolutely, we need nothing of the law, that you're saved by grace through faith. And this gospel that I preach, and he uh, said, this gospel that I preach uh, needs nothing from the law or anything previous to it. This is what the book of Galatians is about. Now I want to call your attention to something. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are what's called the synoptic gospels. Each one of them has a great commission. You know what? You've seen them many times. Look at Matthew chapter number, uh, I think it's, what is it, 28, 26. Let's go over here and find it. Matthew 28. I was right to begin with verse 19. Matthew 28, verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you alway, even unto the end of the world. Amen. That's a commission. I want you to go to Mark chapter 16 with me. Mark chapter number 16 and verse 15. Mark 16, 15. He saith unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. 
He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe, in my name shall they cast out devils, they shall, uh, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. I do not believe that there are any contradictions in the Bible. I believe that everything in the Bible that doesn't appear to line up the same needs to be understood chronologically. It's given at a certain time to a certain people for a certain purpose, and it runs its course. When we come to the Gospel of John, the last Gospel written about 90, 95 AD, we've, we've passed all of this. The ministry of the Apostle Paul starts out with, uh, he says, I'm glad I didn't baptize any more than anyone else except a, a few here and there. And then he eventually just completely drops the issue of baptism. By the end of the ministry of the Apostle Paul, he doesn't have anything to say about baptism. And it's because that baptism was for a period, for a certain people, for a reason. And you look at Mark chapter number 16. Look at this very carefully and see what it says. It says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Has anybody ever quoted that to you? This is what the Bible says. It's what it says. It says plainly that if you believe and are baptized, then you, you, you shall be saved. And what are we? We're baptizers. We're Baptists. So how come we don't preach this? We have a reason. We have a reason. I want you to notice what follows. And he that believeth not shall be damned. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. See this? They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Do you know anybody that takes up serpents? Or they drink deadly things? Yes, you do. There's a video on YouTube of a pastor, I think, up in Kentucky or somewhere up in there who has got a big diamondback rattlesnake or something that he's handling, and this thing bites him on his shoulder. He's a young man, and he's gone. He's gone within a few hours after that. I respect him. I respect, I respect his faith. He's certainly no, he's no hypocrite. He's no put on. He believes strongly in what he does. But does the Bible command you to take up serpents? That's the difference. In the Bible, a command is a clear thing. Love others as you love yourself. Does that tell you to love yourself? The word as is so important in that context. To love others as you love yourself. The Bible said no man hates his own flesh, but loves it and nourishes it. It is, a, it is an observation, not a command. The Lord says, I know how much you love yourself. Love the rest of the people like you love yourself. That's what he's saying to them. He didn't command them to love themselves. It's just natural for men to love themselves. And so it is with a serpent. You know the story. I'm sure you've heard it a thousand times about the Apostle Paul on the Isle of Mal Malta. Put his hand into the pile of wood and he was bitten by a uh, serpent. And they expected him to drop dead at any moment. And he didn't. He shook it off into the fire and he went on. Uh, God hand, God's hand protected him. And that started then and it's gone on since then many, many, many times down through the years. The Lord has protected his people from imminent danger. And so why, what's going on with Luke? Well, I mean with, with Mark. Uh, you have what's called the Mark, uh, I think it's called the comma. You get into liberalism and you'll find out that they strike out the last few verses of this Gospel of Mark. It's not even in there. Do any of you have notations in your Bible where it says these are spurious scriptures or they're not, uh, they don't belong in the text or they're highly irregular or, you know, wording like that? Does anybody have that in your Bible? You have a reference Bible with notations in it? Well, let's just look it up and you'll find that that's what they teach. And why do they do that? They do it to get away with snake handling and drinking poison and baptism in order to be saved. Now, to this day, most of the Protestant churches believe in, in baptizing. They baptize their infants, and they have a little baptismal font, and they sprinkle them with water. And it's a real nice ceremony and all that, but it has really nothing to do with saving their soul. Here's the distinct, distinguishing characteristic of Baptists. We believe in baptizing believers. That's what it's about. And in Europe, they called us Anabaptist, and that's what the term means, a rebaptizer. 
They'd taken the baby, sprinkled them, but we say, you got to show something in your heart where you're a true believer, and then we will baptize you as a true believer. For us, it is not salvation. For us, it is an indication of salvation. It shows the individual being baptized has been saved. But all of this is to say this. <coughs> when we come down to the last gospel, 90, 95 A.D., and the commission given to it, it has to do with what John says. These things are written that you might believe, to get God's word out, to preach the gospel, to tell people about Christ. There's nothing greater than that. There's nothing about serpents. There's nothing about tongues. There's nothing about any of that in the gospel of John, written many years after Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You have to understand the chronology. If the Syrophoenician woman comes to the Lord and says, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. He said, it's not meat to take the food of the children and give it to dogs. See, how do you understand that? You understand it in the context of the time. In other words, it was before the door was open to the Gentiles. It was before the Jews had rejected the master, had rejected the gospel of the kingdom. It was still being preached to them in exclusion to everybody else. And, you know, I've gone through that many times with you before. But these are the kind of things, if you get them, you understand how to interpret the Bible. You, it opens up the scripture for you. They're very important things. The Bible is not a simple book. <laughs> it is not a simple book. It is not black and white where everything fits in this category or that category. There are things in the Bible you cannot categorize. You can't place them. And the reason for that is because it represents the mind of Christ, the mind of God. So, that being true, and no doubt in my mind that it is, the, uh, uh, nothing changes about the gospel. When the Apostle Paul in the book of Galatians preached the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, he said, I declare unto you the gospel, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Not a word about baptism, not a word about tongues, not a word about snakes, not a word about poison. He defined the bab uh, baptism as simply believing in your heart in the Lord Jesus Christ in his death and his burial and his resurrection. And then in Romans chapter number 10, he said, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. A simple act of faith, accepting what Christ did for you on the cross. That's our message today. I don't get up here and tell people unless you're baptized you're not saved. I don't tell them you have to drink poison to be saved. I don't tell them you have to handle snakes to be saved. I tell them to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Acts chapter 16 to the Philippian jailer. But you have to understand there is a progression through this. Now you remember I, talk, I was talking to you about the Gnostic Gospels. And uh, I want to get into liberal Christianity today. You say what is liberal Christianity? Let me give you four things. There are more. Number one, they deny the virgin birth. Number two, they deny the, uh, the inspiration of the scriptures. Number three, they, they change the gender of God from a male to a female. Whichever one you like the most makes no difference. And they deny the new birth. They deny the new birth. And then they preach a social gospel. So why do they do this? Why does liberal Christianity do this? Why do they come out and just absolutely just throw, jettison everything that we believe and create their own theology? Let me read to you what a theosophist wrote over a hundred years ago. And what she said is literally, and we're indebted to her for this, because what she says is literally the, the, the doctrine of liberal Christianity today. Her name is Helen Blavat Blavatsky. She's the, she's the uh, mother of theosophy. Theosophy means the wisdom of God. Theos and sophist, God's wisdom. They always choose terms like that to give credibility to who they are, you know. They like titles and all that. The wisdom of God. Here's what she says. The Bible makes it quite clear the entity named as Jehovah chose Israel to be his chosen people. As Jehovah is but the particular national deity of Israel. He has nothing to do with other nations or races. And it seems strange that non-Israelites should want anything to do with him. This applies to Christians too, as Jesus criticized and rebelled against the rules and commandments of Jehovah more than anyone else, and the Gospels are full of such instances. And she uses time and time and time again to show you what these are. I'm not going to deal with that um, today because I want to cover a, a greater subject today. In 
the case, Jesus himself believed and taught that he, Jesus, was to be a savior only to the Israelites and not to other races and peoples of the world. Is that true? No, it's not true. No, John the Baptist says, this is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the Israelites. No, what did he say? Sin of the world. All right. Sin of the world. Paul said God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Christ said to them, I have sheep, other sheep, which are not of this fold. The Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. He did not come just for the Israelites. That was passing. He came for all mankind. And both, of course, they don't have any problem with, with twisting things. Listen to this. There are also numerous instances related in the Gospels where Gentiles, meaning non-Jewish people, approached Jesus to be healed, only for him to inform them that I was not sent to the Gentiles, but to the children of Israel. Is it right to take the children's bread and give it to dogs? I mentioned that a moment ago. She uses this. She uses this to say that when the Lord Jesus came 2,000 years ago, he came as the Savior of Israel, or Israelites. Savior in the sense that they understand Savior to be. And that he excluded all Gentiles. Now you remember how I told you before. If you can understand how to put that thing, what he talked about to her, and he said, he said it's not me to take the children's uh, bread and give it to dogs. What did she do? What was her response to him? That's okay, Lord. It's the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the table, right? Oh, woman, how much great, how great thy faith. She was a Syrophoenician, right? She was a Gentile, okay? And he welcomed her in and received her because of her faith. You remember what Blavatsky said? That he was only, and he, he excluded the Gentiles, and he was only for the Jew. But remember, where does that fit? Where does that fit? How do I understand that? Why would he say that to her? Why would he say, go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel? Go not in the way of the Gentiles, but go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Why would he say that? How do I understand that? I am a dispensationalist. I was not a dispensationalist when I got saved. I wasn't anything when I got saved. <laughs> I just knew I was saved. I didn't know anything. I was as ignorant as you can be. But I got into the Bible, began to read it, and I learned what a dispensationalist was. It is somebody that believes that God deals with mankind according to a certain rule, standard, law, or something during that period of time. But then that transitions into another period of time, and over and over and over again. We are in what's called the age, or the dispensation, of the grace of God, where any man can approach into Christ. The, the veil ripped from the top to the bottom, new and living way, that is to say, through his flesh. That's what's called the age of grace. This was not the age of grace. This was before the final decision had been made about whether Israel was going to accept or reject their Messiah. And John the Baptist, remember, could have been Elijah, which was prophesied to come. And Elijah was going to come to Israel for the day of the Lord. Okay? Not Gentiles for the day of Christ. Is there a difference between the day of Christ and the day of the Lord? You better believe there is. There's a vast difference between the two. Okay, we understand that. And I don't, I don't have to convince anybody in here this morning that it has a place. But you see, she cherry picks things like that and pulls them out. Not only her, my dear friend, but liberal Christianity is in with her exactly. Right down the line. And on she goes. Let me read another one for you. In the secret doctrine... H.P. Vlavasky says, Jesus the initiate. There we go. Or Jehoshua, the type from whom the historical Jesus was copied. See what she said? Listen carefully. Was not of pure Jewish blood and thus recognized no Jehovah, nor did he worship any planetary God beside his own father whom he knew and with whom he communed as every high initiate does, spirit to spirit soul to soul. So what, he, what this woman has said is the Lord Jesus Christ had been initiated into a higher spiritual realm of understanding and he only accommodated the Jehovah of the Old Testament 
for the sake of the Jews 2,000 years ago, but his real father was spirit to spirit, soul to soul. And he said many things to these Jews of his day 2,000 years ago simply to, uh, to appease them and make it, make it easier for him to be accepted into their number, but didn't believe a bit of it. Now, this is what liberal Christianity teaches folks, and this is what Blavatsky taught. This is what Gnosticism taught, teaches. There's not a dime's worth of difference between a Gnostic and a liberal Christian. Really? Really? Not a dime's worth of difference. Now listen to the Ophite Gnostic. Here's what he says. The Ophite Gnostic Christians, of course that's using the word Christian very, very loosely, maintained that Jehovah was an inferior being and rejected the Old Testament entirely giving as the reason that it was a product of and related to this inferior being. Bishop Marcion, and he's called Marcion the heretic, insisted that the Jewish God Jehovah was totally different and distinct from the deity who sent Jesus to reveal the di divine truth. That's what Blavatsky just said. That Jesus is not related to the Jehovah of the Old Testament. Jesus is related to that spirit who is his father that sent him spirit to spirit, soul to soul. One more time. Remember, Sophia is an emanation of the monad. And Plato taught this hundreds of years before Christ. Sophia messed up and in the process brought forth a demiurge. A demiurge is a lesser God, a created God. And that demiurge was Jehovah. He doesn't know he's a created God, but he's a lesser being. On, and, and then this Jehovah creates archons, which help him. What's an archon? Angel, cherubim, seraphim, things like that. Now, folks, these people believe that. And I want to tell you something. If you nail a liberal Christian to the wall, he will agree with most of what I just said. That the God of the Old Testament was a tribal Jewish God that was not the true God. That we have the spirit of the great God within us and he's a God of love. A God of love would never send anybody to hell. He wouldn't kill all these people. He wouldn't allow all this suffering today. The suffering that we see today can be understood in an entirely different way. These Gnostics, and this is what they taught, totally different and distinct from the deity. Marcion taught the mission and intent of Jesus was to do away with Jehovah, who, who he said was oppressed, opposed to the God and Father of Jesus Christ, as matter is to spirit, impurity to purity. In fact, not even all the Jews of Old Testament days were supporters of Jehovah. Now she gets into the nitty gritty. There were two distinct schools of thought amongst them, the Eloist and the Jehovist. Now this is important. I don't want to be boring, but this is important. It's called the Documentary Hypothesis. It came from the school of Graf Wellhausen in Germany. It is the school of higher criticism. It is, you'll find notations, if you get, get, any, get any liberal commentary or a lot of the, uh, you know, evangelical commentaries, and you'll find they bring in question some of the statements and they'll say, this is Eloist, or this is Jehovah. They'll come along and they'll say that the book of Genesis was written by probably four or five different people, and then later compiled, put together by the Jews. They have all kinds of mishmash like that all through the Old Testament where there's a conflict between the Elohist and the Jehovist. And of course, this is a conflict with the Jews themselves. And this is what, this is what they're they taught young men in the 1800s. And so when a young man goes into a school like that and he comes out, he, does not, he doesn't more believe this is the word of God. He doesn't believe anything about it. So what's his ministry? His ministry is social justice. That's his ministry. Is not that the ministry of liberalism? Social justice. They're not interested in you being saved. They're interested in, in you relieving the suffering of the world. Well, I'm all for that. Helping the sick. I'm all for that. 
Anything you can do to help the suffering in this, in this world is good because you live a while, you'll see there's plenty of suffering out here. But that's not the major message. There's a problem with man. And the problem with man is sin. And the only way sin can be taken care of is by the sin bearer. But liberal Christianity doesn't teach that. Of course, I use the word, you know, liberal Christianity. They're not Christians. These people are not your brothers and sisters. They don't know the Lord. They're just religionists with crosses on their buildings to try to, to try to present themselves as Christians. They're not Christians. They don't know the Lord. And, uh, and where did they come from? I'm giving you the, I'm giving you the nuts and bolts of, uh, of where this stuff starts. This Graf Wellhausen documentary hypothesis redefining the Jehovah of the Old Testament because there was a conflict between the two and that the Lord Jesus Christ disassociated himself with the Jehovah of the Old Testament. Liberal Christianity is teaching you that the Christ that we worship today is really not God manifest in flesh. That their Christ is a good moral teacher who had some kind of a great spirit come upon him and for, the, for his day he was accepted. Miracles are out. They didn't believe in the miracles. They believe it's what you call hyperbole. It's all blown out of shape. And so they carry on with this and people go to their churches today and they buy into it. And when they do, sad to say, folks, if you get into the wrong church, it could lead you to hell. I was reading Maurice Rawlings' book. I just got it the other day. And he reminded me of something. Maurice Rawlings was a, uh, was a, a, a cardiologist in Chattanooga, Tennessee. He was a doctor to, uh, 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 to uh, uh, Eisenhower, President Eisenhower in his day. Uh, Eisenhower had heart problems. I think he died from a heart attack or heart failure. And uh, you know who I'm talking about. He's the commander of the Allied Forces over there in Europe, World War II. And he's the man, the author of D-Day. So uh, Maurice Rawlings was one of his physicians. I'm sure he had more. Maurice Rawlings was working with a man who was coming and going. And this man went. And Maurice Rawlings was able to bring him back. And when he brought him back, and I'm not overplaying this, he said the man's face was full of terror. Terror. He said, don't let me go. Don't let me die. Don't let me go to this place. And the doctor, of course, was a, I guess the best say that he's an agnostic. He didn't read his Bible, didn't go to church. He wasn't a Christian, any of that. He was just a professional, medical professional. And he said, uh, the man said to him, help me. Help me. Pray with me. Do something to keep me out of hell. And the cardiologist said, he told him, he said, I'm not a preacher. He said, pray for yourself. And then he went away again. Then he brought him back again. And he said, then he prayed with him. He said, well, try to remember the words he learned in Sunday school. Uh, believe on Jesus. Call his name out. Trust him. And he'll save you. Something as generalized as that. He said, the man prayed that prayer. And when he prayed that prayer, he lost him again and brought him back. But there was no, there was no terror. No terror. And apparently he recovered from it. But here's the point. This is the important point. You've got a lot of books out here on life after life. And you've got books by uh, various authors who talk about, uh, about uh, the other side. And they talk about uh, uh, near-death experiences. Yeah, that's a good term for it, near-death. And he said, uh, he said, let me tell you something. He said, I'm a doctor. He said, these people are writing after the fact by doing the research and interviewing people who have been through this months or even years before. He said, I was there when it happened. And he said, when being there when it happened, he said, I got a firsthand testimony, not secondhand, and not later, but right on the spot. And he said, I could see the terror in their faces when they came back. He said, the people that are writing and he made the good point, and this, I think, is a very good point. He said the human mind has a tendency that if it, in, if, that if it encounters something as horrific as that, that it has a, the human mind has this protective reflex where it will forget it or make it better. 
And so when you go test, when you go listen to them, you go listen to their testimony, years later, it's changed. And this is why they have so many of them that have a good test, a, a good, uh, you know, encounter. They see this being of light. But does the Bible say that Satan can transform himself into an angel of light? So be very careful. You cannot discount them, but be very careful what you're dealing with when it comes to near-death experiences. Be very careful because some of those people have had a vision of hell. And that's being God being gracious and merciful to them. And thanks be unto God for that. And I have met people here at Temple years ago. One man who had passed on, then he came back. And he was, I never seen anything like him. He was the kind of fellow that just, he is full of joy and full of vision and full of love. And, and he said, maybe I'm going to go back today. I mean, where he had been, he was so fired up over it that he was ready to leave at any moment. He had seen something to him that was far better than where he is now. But for, for whatever reason, God uh, allowed him to come back and say, well, now, is there anything in the Bible about that? Yes. Second Corinthians 12. The Apostle Paul said, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. That's Paul. Carried out of the body and carried into the presence of the Lord. Amen. So you just can't categorize everything and easily pass it all off and say, uh, and say there's no truth to it. Now, do you believe the Bible? I do. I believe the Bible. One of the reasons I believe the Bible is because I know how men treat the Bible. Men didn't write the Bible. Have you ever noticed how they treat it? Well, that's, that man wrote that book. or this, They don't like it. Why did, if, if man wrote the Bible, why would he hate it so much? See, they don't, they don't like the Bible. Man didn't write the Bible. God wrote the Bible. He used a human hand to pin it down. God wrote it. And the Bible, of course, is the Word of God. Now, I've said many times, and I'll say it again, it's important. The Bible is not written to make you a Baptist. It was not written to make you a Presbyterian, a Methodist, Lutheran, whatever. It was not written for that purpose. It was written to reveal God. And it was a manifestation that begins in Genesis and goes all the way through Revelation because Revelation is the apocalypsis, which is the unveiling. Revelation doesn't end anything. It just opens up the future. So it is written to reveal God. And it is a progressive revelation from Genesis all the way through to the end. I want to give you three archaeological finds and I'll come to a close this morning. Archaeology is a friend to the Bible. Amen. Amen. It is a friend to the Bible. The Roman governor Pontius Pilate, who say, they say never existed, well they found an inscription at Caesarea Maritima with his name on it. That was in 1961. When I was there, I saw a reproduction. They wouldn't leave, obviously, they wouldn't leave the original. But there it was, Pilatus. I think it was in Latin, Pilatus. And Pilate, who was, of course, a Roman, Latin, uh, he did live because there's his name. And then in 1990, the discovery in Jerusalem of an ossuary, a burial box for bones. That's what, it, that's what an ossuary is. It bore the name of Caiaphas, the high priest who condemned Jesus. Isn't that something? Now these boxes, these bone boxes, have what's called a patina. A patina. It's hard to fake a patina. So what's a patina? A patina is a covering that develops over time. If something's 2,000 years old, there is a very, very thin covering over that. And it's uniform, of course. It's not something that's been put in there. It's called the patina. How many has ever seen something old and it has an appearance to it? And you, you know it. You know this is old. You know, that's the patina. And these ossuaries have a patina on them. And they have this writing. And one was to uh, Caiaphas, the high priest. Is he in the Bible? Well, of course he is. And then there's another ossuary that has come to light. And this is one that bears the names of Jesus, James, and Joseph. Three of the most prominent people in the New Testament, the ancient Aramaic words inscribed on the limestone box state that it belongs to James, son of Joseph, 
brother of Jesus. Now, Jesus was not an uncommon name 2,000 years ago. That's his Greek name. And uh, it was not uncommon. Neither were any of these names uncommon. But here's what makes it interesting. All three of them together on an ossuary. And one of them says that James is the brother of Jesus. And you go in here and you do, of course, we understand half-brother. We understand that. But uh, you go into the New Testament and begin to study James. You'll find that at first James didn't believe in him. Then you'll find that James gradually accepted him. And then James became one of the pillars of the early church, Peter, James, and John. And that James wound up writing one of the New Testament books. And James, therefore, no question about it, was, was, a, was, a, was one, a, an apostle in the sense of one sent forth. Yes, he was. James' name shows up here as the brother of Jesus. So what, what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying that we have a piece of stone that tells you that James was the brother of Jesus. Now, Blavatsky, I marvel at her because she spends all this time talking about who Christ was and, and all this stuff I gave you. Yet there are other places on the Internet. All you got to do is just do a little Googling. And she completely denies it even existed. You can't have it both ways. <laughs> Which one's it going to be? Either he existed or he didn't exist. You know what happens to people? I think this is what happened to her. After they've been in this thing a while, the evidence becomes overwhelming that Christ did live. Like Josephus talked about, a man named Christus that was alive in the first century. No question about it, he was alive. And the overwhelming evidence says that the man lived. So what do you do when you find out you were wrong? Well, you just reshape, you know. Then you reinterpret. Then you present it in a different manner, and that's what you get. I don't think most folks understand what an effect this woman has had, though. She has had a profound effect on theology and uh, a lot of, well, even history for that matter. All right, let's have a word of prayer. We'll let you go, and we'll go to Sunday school here. Brother Gene Lawson.